Good afternoon. We're going to get started today with the webinar for the NIH Director's Awards, Broadening Experiences in Scientific Training, or the Best Award. So this is our agenda for today. Sally Rocky is going to give you an overview of the initiatives and, and why we care about, why the NIH cares about this and other things that the NIH is going to be doing. I'm going to tell you a little bit, my name is Trish Lobosky and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the Common Fund and the funding announcement. Um, we're just going to talk about some of the subtleties in the funding announcement, which I'm sure you've all read, but it, it'll be there. Then Dr. Larry Borboom is going to, from the Center for Scientific Review is going to tell you about the review process and how that's going to work. And finally, we'll have a question and answer session with the four coordinators for this program, um, Nancy Desmond, and Allison Hall, Steve Korn, and myself. And Larry Borboom will stay for that, and we will discuss um, any questions that you have. So, just a couple tips before we get started. You're all in listening mode and you can't talk to us. So for us, we're all sitting in a room around a table talking into microphones. So we miss you, but we thought that this would be controlled chaos. Um, because of that, we want your questions and um, the email address to send the questions to is right there on the slides. It's workforce underscore award at mail.nih.gov. So please send your questions. You can start sending them anytime. We're monitoring that email box. And then what we're going to do at the end, as I already mentioned, is we're going to read some of those. We'll condense them. Um, we're going to read some of those. We will not reveal. They'll be de-identified. We will not reveal who asked us what. And then we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. In a few weeks, I can't tell you exactly when, but in a few weeks, these slides um, an audio recording of today's webinar and a modified set of frequently asked questions will be on the program website and the address is there, commonfund.nih.gov backslash workforce. So you can check that out now. There are frequently asked questions, um, but you can check that out and um, in a few weeks you can actually have these slides. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Sally Rocky, who's the Deputy Director for Extramural Research here at the NIH, and she's going to tell you um, about this program a little bit. Thanks, Trish. Um, I wanted to just give you a background of uh, where, we, where we came from um, that led to the development of this program. I want to welcome all of you that um, are interested in the program in its second round. We had a fabulous first round, and we expect to have an even a uh, more fabulous second round, so thank you so much for participating. Um, a number of years ago, the, there was a subcommittee of the uh, advisory committee to the director uh, that was chaired by Shirley Tillman and myself to take a look uh, at the biomedical workforce, specifically with the charge to develop a sustainable and diverse biomedical workforce that can inform decisions about training the optimal number of people and the appropriate types of positions that will advance science. And then based on the recommendations of this committee, NIH is to use those, that information and take actions to support a sustainable workforce. So we did a year of very heavy lifting um, and uh, putting together our recommendations. Those recommendations and the entire report are available to you at the links that you see at the bottom of the slide. And I encourage any of you who wants to do a deeper dive into um, the recommendations uh, to take advantage of those, uh, the website and the reports is up there. I will say there's a number of recommendations that are not related directly to the BEST program, but the BEST program was really um, a linchpin of what we did, so I want to explain how we got to the recommendation for this program. So, one of the things that we did during the course of our investigation is to look at those individuals who get PhDs here in the United States in the biomedical world where they end up. And um, this slide, uh, let me just explain a few things on this slide. We looked at uh, college uh, PhDs trained in the United States. Uh, the, the numbers in green are numbers we have quite a bit of confidence in. The numbers in yellow is we have some confidence in, and the number in red is we have less confidence in. One of the things you'll note here is that there's quite a bit of red surrounding postdocs, and the reason being is that data on postdocs, which is, uh, uh, is quite complicated to get at, 
So we are not confident in our postdoc numbers here. But nonetheless, based on what we could um, analyze and where we, we determined um, individuals who got PhDs in the United States went um, is, is shown to you at the bottom of the slide. I'll start over on the right side. Uh, very few of our trained PhDs are unemployed. About 2% of our biomedical workforce's uh, trainees are unemployed. Um, in non-research related, that means if an individual, for example, um, goes on to become a science teacher in high school, um, not that it's, it's not a worthy um, outcome for their training, it's just it's not research related. So we put them in a box here, um, and that's about 13% of our workforce is in non-research related. The other uh, four blue boxes are those where they're related to research or research directly. About 18% of our workforce ends up in industry at the bench. So these are, these are scientists actually conducting research for industry. Um, about 43% end up in academia, 6% in government, and 18% in research-related areas. Those of us who administer research either here in the government, in industry, and other research-related activities are in that box on the far left. So um, while I wouldn't say it was a total surprise, it was interesting that only 43% of our, our workforce, our trained PhDs, end up in um, academia yet. The general consensus was that the, what we are training individuals to do is to um, eventually end up in academia. So we wanted to uh, recommend a way to diversify the type of training that individuals receive during their PhD in order to best prepare them for those four, any of those four boxes. So we feel that it's important in all of the research and research related boxes that they all contribute to this fantastic enterprise that we're involved with in biomedical research and therefore we should, we should um, best prepare them for the myriad of research outcomes that they might have. And that led to the best program. So we had a number of other conclusions. Um, our basic conclusions were the combination of a large upsurge in U.S. trained PhDs, increased influx of foreign trained PhDs, and the aging of the biomedical workforce made launching a traditional academic research career increasingly difficult. And then the last bullet here says the current training programs do little to prepare people for anything besides an academic research career, despite clear evidence that a declining percentage of graduates find such positions in the future. So um, two things are important here. One is, of course, we want to train individuals as, as um, optimal researchers, so scientific training um, is, is very important. But the second, as I mentioned before, is to assure that they're best prepared for the jobs that they're going to be able to seek in the future. So, um, and there's our recommendation in yellow that led to the, uh, um, to the best program. You can read at your leisure many of the other recommendations that we made about the other pieces of the um, workforce, many of which we have already implemented. But the best program, as I say, set, said, is, is a centerpiece for our activities. <clears throat> so, we developed the best program. Um, we did it in rapid speed. Last year, we um, had a webinar similar to this when we put out the first uh, request for applications. Uh, the idea here is that um, we wanted one application per institution because we determined, we uh, believed that what we could learn at an institutional level could be transferable among departments, between colleges, et cetera. So we wanted the, the institution not to compete against itself, but instead um, compete against other institutions in the country. Um, we had up to $250,000 in direct costs per year, um, and uh, that uh, program closed last year. Again, um, we, we, we hoped that we would have a, uh, a great diversity of, um, of really creative ideas, which we did last year. Um, we received over 100 applications, and we announced those awards in September. And if you are curious about the awards, you can go look at that link um, to uh, see the 10 awards that we made last year. So there were a couple other facets to this program that I want to point out to you. Um, we really encourage, and again, you will see uh, again this year, we encourage institutions to leverage funds with existing institutional offices and programs, local resources inside and outside the institution, and partner with industry or other entities that were going to be essential to the type of trainings and experiences that we were going to offer to the, the um, students in this program. Remember, the program is about training graduate students and or postdocs. Um, 
we wanted to make sure that the, there was a um, uh, rigorous analysis to demonstrate the success of the applications and the, and the um, objectives that the applicants had proposed. So there was to be a rigorous analysis of the demonstrated impact. And then what's really key, and you'll hear more about this, is that this is a experimental program that we hope to develop best practices that can be widely disseminated throughout the biomedical research community. So not only do we ask that the investigators and the winners of these awards get together and exchange ideas among themselves, that as the best practices emerge, that they will be shared among institutions across the country and among programs throughout the country in order to have the, the best practices um, implemented throughout and become more sy systemic within um, the biomedical research community. So this really is an experimental program, but there is an expectation for a lot of um, collaboration among the winners of the program and then among the entire community as we go forward. So. Um, Thank you very much for participating, and you have a great crew here that's going to be able to answer all your questions as you go forward as the program's explained. Thanks, Sally. Um, this is Trish again, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Common Fund is, and I'm um, going to talk about some of those specifics that Sally referenced in the funding announcement. Um, I'm going to remind you to send your questions. I have the email address down at the bottom of the slides there, so please send your questions now and um, we'll get to them at the end of the time. Okay, so what is the Common Fund? Well, besides being where I work, um, in, in 2004 you might have noticed, oh, I'm sorry, that was, okay. You might have noticed that the NIH set up a huge initiative, which is the NIH Roadmap. Um, a few years later, when Congress um, reauthorized the NIH, they, created this new division, which is the Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives. So this, within this division is this small space, it's called the Common Fund, and any questions you have about that I'm happy to take uh, later. This is a dedicated, it's sort of a corporate space, a place um, to do science a little bit differently. And here's a look at all the different programs that we administer within our office. So you can see that the areas of science are very different and spread out across all the institutes and centers interests. So up on the upper corner in the red is the program that we're talking about today, strengthening the biomedical research workforce. But you can see that there's a number of different areas of science represented here from the human microbiome, um, knockout mouse phenotyping, high-risk, high-reward research that you may have heard of before, Pioneer Awards, New Innovators, Early Appendix Awards, etc. So you can see that it's a really large space for a lot of different kinds of science. And we have a lot of really um, important criteria, we think, in order to make a program fit within the Common Fund. So. The program has to be transformative. It really has to do something different. It's, it's, some of these programs have started new fields. Some of them have changed fields um, in a large way. These programs are catalytic. This is not, these are not long programs. They're here for five to ten years and that is all. They are very goal driven and milestone driven. They must achieve those goals and milestones within that amount of time and then they're done. They're not maintained for many different years, so they build something, they build a field, and then they transition out of the common fund. These programs cut across the interests of multiple centers and institutes at the NIH. They, the multiple centers and institutes work together, as you'll see in a moment, um, to carry out this work. And these programs are supposed to be unique in that there's something that no other institute or center by themselves would be likely to do. So what makes this program common fundable, which is a word that we sort of made up in the office, and, and the answers are there on the screen in front of you. One of the things that we try to build are new approaches or tools um, in a field. So one of the things we're trying to do with this workforce program is to really have a change in the training landscape with this program so that these other careers are acceptable, are encouraged, and are are represented as things that these students and postdocs can get training in. 
So the idea is that the training landscape will be changed to give the pre-docs and post-doc fellows direct exposure. And by direct exposure, sometimes that means a hands-on meaningful experience to um, many different career options. The idea is to provide them with knowledge about the careers, but not necessarily to train them to be um, that career choice at this point. The other thing that this award will do is enable infrastructure. It really is an infrastructure award that um, new offices might be set up, new courses, new curricula, different training opportunities will be um, initiated. So I think Sally explained the challenge. Um, together with the long training period to get a PhD and then stay on as a postdoc, um, the declining percentage of these people obtaining that traditional academic research position, and you know, other factors that might make that a less career option, a less attractive career option. So the opportunity is this program, and then one opportunity within this program that we're talking about here today is the RFA cited at the bottom of the page. It's number 13-019 and this is um, the best award. I want to illustrate here the trans NIH nature of this award, and you can see here the co-chairs of the program. Sally just talked to you, but Story Landis and Judy Greenberg are also involved. The working group coordinators who are all in the room here today um, from four different institutes and centers. And then finally, this trans NIH working group so all the members that you can see listed there on your screen from all across the different institutes and centers at the NIH. So now I want to talk a little bit about the FOA, the RFA that you are looking at and reading and trying to um, figure out what we meant when we wrote it. So really what we meant is what it says. And the, the important thing is that most graduate programs and postdoc training programs really do focus on training those individuals for a career as an academic research. And, and that makes perfect sense, that a PI would be able to do that better than anybody else. However, that PI might not have all the knowledge to train their own students in other career choices. And so that's what this award is supposed to enable. So we're looking for applications that propose establishing a new program implementing that program and then rigorously assessing and evaluating those approaches to see what really works. This, as Sally said, this is intended to be an experiment. It's not a training grant. This is supposed to be different. So we want things that are new and different and transformative. Two major goals. The first one is obviously to prepare these trainees for the breadth of careers that they might encounter as they leave training. And secondly, there's going to be a network. The network of awardees, and this has already started with the first round of awardees, are working together to share their experiences, share the evaluation of the experiences, and then disseminate these experiences, best practices, if you wish, um, throughout the training community. So here's the details. As Sally already mentioned, 250000 plus full indirect costs five-year award, it's non-renewable. As I said, these are catalytic awards, five years and that's the end. So it's not a training grant, there are not slots, and that's really important here under allowable cost. Um, faculty, staff salary is allowed to build that infrastructure and set up the program and, and run the program. Um, no tuition stipend or salary for students or postdocs is allowed. We cannot pay the students as they go away to perform something um, training related. You can pay for consultant costs, perhaps evaluation if necessary, um, equipment supplies, travel. If the students or postdocs are traveling to a site, you can pay for that, and other different program related expenses. Um, an important bullet down there at the bottom, at this time we don't have any plans for a future solicitation. This won't be offered again next year. The institutions that are eligible must have a PhD, MD, or veterinary degree. PhDs is what we're really looking for, um, degree granting ability. So institutions with postdocs only um, are encouraged to team up with uh, an institution that does grant those degrees. 
However, that degree granting institution, if it has a lot of postdocs, those postdocs must be included in the novel program. So it can't just be an add-on. They really have to be included. All the activities have to be available to all the trainees regardless of how they are funded. So one of the things that's really important is that an individual department would not be where you'd want the, to see this working out of. It can't be just a, a department. It should reach across the whole university. As Sally mentioned, you want to leverage existing institutional resources to broaden the experience. The other thing that we would like to see is that students are exposed, students and postdocs are exposed to this information early in their training. The programs want to identify various career paths, not just one, and develop some meaningful experiences in these areas. Um, the B in BEST award stands for broadening. So applications that come in that are really focused on just one area um, did not fare very well last year in the review, and, and we agree with that. Trainees should be allowed to choose between the experiences, but of course they might be directed to choose what's most appropriate for them. And very importantly, it's, this program is not meant to train them fully, but it should just position them so that they can be successful for the next steps in their own career development. We, we fully appreciate and, and we are very happy that lots of the trainees are going on to enter these academic research careers. However, um, and, and we, we expect those trainees to benefit from some of the activities that your programs will provide. However, if the program is designed only to target that population, that would be considered non-responsive. One of the things mentioned in the RFA is that we'd like to see positive and attractive exit pathways designed so that it's not punitive. If the student or postdoc, well student mostly I guess in this case, does not need to obtain that PhD degree to fulfill their career goals, then they should be allowed to leave certainly and it should not be a punitive sort of thing. This program is not intended for master's level students. So this is a very long term pie in the sky goal of the program is really thinking about how graduate programs in general might be changed over the next five or so years and how they might define themselves and their purpose in training students and postdocs. How they recruit them, how they admit them, support them, steer them and mentor them to, to support them and prepare them appropriately for their future. Now to get into some specifics, the principal investigator, the PI can be any person with the skills, knowledge, and resources necessary. They should be an established investigator in the area that the application is targeted, therefore training or career development. They should be capable of providing leadership, administrative and scientific leadership, um, to both develop and carry out the program. That PI will be expected to monitor and assess and evaluate and be involved in the evaluation of the program. And they'll be the ones responsible for submitting all the documents and yearly reports. It's absolutely fine to have multiple PIs in, the, in your application. However, if you do, please include your multiple PI plan and describe that to the reviewers. Partnerships, while they're not required, we imagine that one of the really strong ways to develop a program list like this would be to form partnerships with the different organizations that would actually employ these trainees. Um, and there's some examples there on the slide. They can do this in different ways. They may be providing opportunities for internships. Maybe they'll help teach in some of the novel courses that you might develop. They might sit on the steering committee for the program. They can, there's many other ways that they would contribute to success of the program. It's important to spell out exactly what they'll do and what they're providing. One of the things that's, that's really important is a lot of you are already doing this sort of training out there and we acknowledge this and, and we don't think that you should be penalized for doing that obviously. However, if you already have a lot of training going on, what you have to do in this application is carefully explain how this is different 
how what you're proposing in this application is different from what you have already, not just that you're going from a program that would serve 20 people to a program that would serve 40. That would not be um, uh, received very well by the reviewers. So really, what, what is this BEST award going to bring to your university and why will it make it special and different and transform the environment? As stated before, we expect that the program will be larger than one department and it may cross school boundaries. We're looking that the goal would be to transform the research training culture at the university and then, as Sally mentioned, disseminate these findings widely across the training community. It's important to leverage funds and leverage resources from your existing institutional offices and programs. Um, some sources outside the institution, including partners. Evaluation, again, it, this is an experiment. So as we're all scientists here, we know if we are going to do an experiment, we want to figure out if it works and what works and what works for who. Therefore, evaluation is a very important part of this program. The individual awardee will be evaluating their own program and they'll be working together with the rest of the awardees and the NIH to um, evaluate the entire program overall. But within your application, you should spell out very clearly what the metrics are, um, how you're going to measure whether or not this works in your environment. So this is, in a, it's an interactive network. It already is because it's already started. Um, each year, the awardees are going to meet at an annual meeting in Bethesda, and the date is in the RFA in front of you. It's in October, and you should write that on your calendar now because if you get one of these awards, you'll be required to attend. Um, so we'll see each other once a year. We have monthly teleconference calls and we're discussing evaluation and we're discussing different experiences the awardees are trying at their universities. And all the awardees will receive site visits from the NIH staff. Here's some important dates. So this second version of this RFA was published in the mid-January and there's a letter of intent due date at the end of February. This letter of intent is not required and it's not binding, but please send it in because it helps us a lot to figure out the review sessions and, and how to set those up. The receipt date is the end of March and the review will happen in July. The earliest that this money would be awarded is in September and again the annual meeting is at the end of October. So those are important um, dates for you to note. Now I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Borboom, who's going to discuss the review of these awards. Thanks, Trish. Um, I'm Larry Borboom from the Center for Scientific Review. And as Trish indicated, um, I will be uh, discussing topics related to the review of these applications. Um, like all grant applications that are reviewed at the NIH, there will be two levels of review for the best program. Uh, first level is peer review or for scientific and technical merit. And then there's a second level of review uh, by a national advisory council. The um, peer review is the typical study section that uh, you're all familiar with. And it'll be at this uh, review meeting where the applications are discussed and scored. We're expecting that there will be two of these meetings and we're planning to have the first one on July 10th and 11th, and that'll be followed by another meeting a couple of weeks later on July 24th and 25th. Um, it's important for you to note that these meetings are set up um, and devoted exclusively to the BEST program. There will be no other types of applications reviewed in these meetings, and all the reviewers who are recruited to participate in the review um, are recruited specifically for their expertise to review the best applications. Um, at the advisory council meeting where funding decisions uh, will be made, uh, that meeting will, will occur on September 17th of uh, this year. The review panel will consist of approximately 25 reviewers for each of the two meetings that we will hold. 
and there will be um, reviewers on the panel from both academic institutions and reviewers from outside of academia. Um, and the, um, uh, the people from outside of academia will, um, will include um, representation from uh, the list of, of organizations that I've mentioned here, plus some others, pharmaceutical industry, government, biotech, um, and so on. These non-academic people represent the types of individuals who have been highly successful in careers outside of academia, uh, the kinds of people that the best program is targeted for. And these people will be looking closely at the applications to um, uh, answer the question, to what extent will the program that is being proposed have been of help to them when they were um, uh, a PhD student or a postdoc. So these people we consider to be uh, a very important part of the review panel. Uh, the reviewers will, uh, for each application, write an overall impact paragraph and write comments about the strengths and weaknesses for each of the five uh, core criteria that are listed here, significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. Uh, so the application gets an overall impact score and also gets a score for, for each of these five core criteria. Uh, one is the best score that can be obtained and nine is the poorest score. Uh, again, here are the, uh, the five core criteria that we will evaluate and I will uh, speak in a little more detail about each of them in the coming slides. Um, much of this information has already been um, uh, discussed by both Dr. Rocky and Dr. Lebowski, uh, but I think it bears repeating. And, uh, and all of this information is also in the RFA, so um, uh, please refer to the RFA as well as you're thinking about preparing your application. So the first uh, criteria is significance. And uh, here the reviewers are going to be uh, evaluating if an important scientific training need is being addressed. And does the application have convincing evidence that the activity being proposed will significantly contribute to exposing graduate students and postdocs to non-academic careers? The uh, second criterion is investigators, and the reviewers will be uh, evaluating if uh, the investigators have the ability to lead, develop, and implement the program. Um, do they uh, devote the effort that's required to um, adequately assure success of the program? And do the faculty who are participating in their program have the experience necessary uh, to mentor the, um, the students? Do they have teaching experience and experience with other aspects of research and research-related careers? Uh, for the purposes of this program, experience and knowledge and research-related careers is considered an asset. Um, the reviewers will also be considering whether the scientific and career accomplishments of the faculty make them good role models for the participants in the program. And do the investigators on in the program have complementary expertise? Uh, as has already been said, if there are multiple PIs, this is fine. Uh, but in the application, you should spell out clearly what the leadership um, approaches and the organizational structure. How, how will you resolve conflicts? Uh, those sorts of things. Third criterion is innovation and has been said already a couple of times. Uh, this is intended to be an experiment. Uh, so we're looking for highly innovative ideas. Um, will the program develop and util utilize innovative approaches and up-to-date best practices to improve the knowledge and skills of the program participants? And will the experience proposed in the program go beyond the traditional graduate student and postdoc training activities? Fourth criterion is approach. Uh, here we'll be looking for um, the goals and objectives being stated 
clearly. In other words, uh, will what you want to do be easily understood by the reviewers? And it's important to, uh, if you're going to be successful, make your application very reviewer friendly. Uh, are there partnerships in place to provide unique training opportunities? Again, this is not required, but it is strongly encouraged. Um, is there an objective evaluative component? And this is important. Um, that will make it possible to meaningfully judge the success of the program. Are uh, adequate plans in place for recruiting a highly qualified and diverse participant pool from across the entire institution? And again, I emphasize we're looking for uh, broad participation, not uh, participation by single departments. Is there a detailed dissemination plan presented for sharing the results of the program? And finally, is there evidence of short and long-term institutional commitment to the program? The final um, criterion is the environment. And here we'll be looking at uh, whether the scientific and training environment contribute to the goals of the program. Does the environment outside the training institution provide opportunities that enhance the educational value of the program? This can be related to the partnerships uh, that I discussed with regard to the approach criterion. Uh, again, is there evidence of institutional commitment to the program? Is there evidence of faculty commitment? Uh, if appropriate, is there evidence of broad collaborative buy-in among departments, centers, schools, and in institutions? Um, and an important consideration is how will resistance to buy-in be dealt with uh, in this program. Finally, um, I want to point out that um, as is generally the policy at the NIH, time is devoted at review meetings to the most meritorious applications. And therefore, if we receive a large number of applications, which we expect, uh, it is possible that not all, the, all, all of the applications will be discussed. And if this happens, um, uh, the applications will be ranked based on their preliminary overall impact scores, and only those top ranking applications will be discussed. And of those applications uh, that are discussed, the discussion order will begin with those receiving the best scores and proceed toward the poorer scoring applications. Okay, thank you, Dr. Borboom. Now we're going to move to the question answer part of this webinar. Um, you might be trying to raise your hand via the question box in the GoToWebinar um, little control panel on your screen. Please know that we're not monitoring that option. What we're monitoring is the email address at the bottom of your screen, or on this slide, it's bigger there. Um, right there on the screen, and, and those will be, that's the way you can communicate your questions to us. So please, we've got a bunch of them here, and I'm going to start reading them, but um, please continue to do that. Okay, I'm going to start out with novelty. And I've got a couple questions here in front of us that say, how does this new RFA differ from the old RFA? Have there been major changes to the RFA um, Based, um, based on the applications that we supported from the first round. Um, the second part of that I think is pretty easy to say. There's not major changes in the RFA at all. Um, there are small, subtle things throughout the new um, announcement in front of you. And I think that you can, you can find those just by looking at the two back to back. But, we're really trying to emphasize innovation. We really want to see things that are new and different. Um, we want to see evidence of faculty buy-in, and if there isn't, how you're going to deal with it. We want to see evidence of sustainability after the five-year award. Um, there are some other subtle things, but I think that's all I can think of. Maybe the rest of the panel has anything to add. They're all shaking their heads no. You have to you have to talk to the microphone. Yes, there's some um, the IRB issues are explained a little bit better. Um, what we did was we tried to things that applicants had problems with last round. We tried to make more clear. So I um, I think those are the big differences. 
Okay, I'm going to talk about responsiveness now. So which of the boxes in Sally's boxes, the green ones, the blue ones, the blue ones were more research intensive and the green ones were not as much, although that's not completely true. Which ones um, should the proposal address? Is the green non-research related box included? And Steve's going to yeah, talk. Yeah, I, I mean, there's not an answer to that. The, the issue is this program is trying to move institutions away from only training people for academic research positions, and so anything else is on the table. Great, thanks. Um, here's another one that says, we have a novel training program for postgraduate PhDs. I guess that's sort of a postdoc. Yeah, a postdoc, postgraduate PhDs. If we wanted to expand it to pre-doc students, is this responsive? So if they have something already in place that's just for their postdocs and they want to extend it, extend it back to their pre-docs, is that responsive? Now, Allison's going to so, take that one. Yeah, I'm going to take that one. I, it is responsive, but I think if you consider the intent of the uh, program, we're really looking for something new, not just an expansion of something that's already on the ground. So if you were designing a program of that type, you might think about uh, novel aspects that enhance the activities for everybody in building career awareness, not merely extending it to a new population of students. Okay, great. Um, would goals for training or exposure um, to be competitive for directing cyber or STTR grants in formation of companies be acceptable goals for a best award? I, I, I think that's a great thing to do, entrepreneurship and, and mm -hmm. yep. moving science into, sure. Okay, great. Um, does it matter what kind of postdocs are involved? MD postdoc doing research or must it be a PhD? I'll take that again too since I took it last year. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to imagine why this program would be geared to clinicians. I'll leave it at that. It's, right, I think you it's... Know, they're, not, they're not excluded, but why would clinicians possibly want to participate in a program like this? Right, I think if they're MD, PhDs that are focused on research or research-related sorts of careers, that's fine. But if they're going to be clinicians, that's not even even if so, if they've paid, if they've spent eight years in an MD PhD program, or it's an MD who paid eighty thousand dollars a year tuition to get a clinical degree, it's hard to imagine why they're now looking for something else. Okay. Since this is not used for trainee stipends themselves, can non-U.S. citizens participate? Go ahead, Nancy. So yes, non-U.S. citizens can participate, but the intent is to, um, is to encourage that the majority of participants um, be U.S. citizens or um, permanent residents. They just have to justify it um, completely, yes. So can a student be supported as a graduate assistant if the research the student does is related to content concerning career options and or evaluation of the program? For example, if the student is a PhD candidate in the School of Education, could their salary um, go toward this? And we're all shaking our heads no. No. No salary for students. That is the bottom line on that. Yeah, Larry? But is, is, is this person uh, going to be participating in the program as a participant or as an evaluator of the program? If they were being hired as a consultant to evaluate the program, I, I think that salary would be okay. You're right. That's different. And, and the, the question doesn't make that clear. You're right. Someone, if they hire consultants to do evaluation or, or something like that, and that person has to be a, happens to be a PH student, PhD student, that could be allowable by us. I don't know how well that would fare in review, frankly. But um, that's going to be a lot of this is going to be up to the reviewers. But um, yeah. 
Um, does it matter that the program cover a broad area of research, like biomedical research, or can an application cover multiple areas, like biomedical research and patent law? This, the purpose of the BEST program is to broaden the, the uh, career opportunities to which graduate students and postdocs um, may be able to contribute. And so the idea is not to focus on research per se, but to expose individuals who are participating in the program to the breadth of career options that may be uh, of interest to them. So certainly patent law could be one of those. Entrepreneurial activities could, could also be pharma, biotech, um, policy type positions. Right. I, I, I'm a little confused by the way they phrase that, but I think that's, that covers the philosophy perfectly. Can programs be piloted with a small group or must it be open to all trainees during the grants? Uh, beginning with a smaller group of participants to uh, do some uh, test bedding, if you will, is um, can be appropriate, but the assumption would be that that would expand to a much larger cohort of individuals um, over the forthcoming years of the award. Can you please clarify exit plans for students? Is the award of a master's degree along with completion of a novel training program appropriate? And I think what we care about is that the exit strategies are not punitive. So I, I wanted to add one piece to that. Um, I think that there are many careers that are related to initial biomedical training that are respectable and important that can be achieved with a master's degree. We're looking to institutions along the way to help identify respectable ways for students who do not need a PhD for their subsequent career uh, to be able to leave. One point that came up in the last review is that we are not looking for certificate programs to train master's students. We do not intend to see the, the, the new uh, powerhouse of certificate programs as exit strategies. Okay, great. So I'm going to Here's another one. This is good. If our PhD program is young, and I don't know what they mean by young, brand new, a year old, two years old, does that put us at a disadvantage compared to mature programs? And I think it depends. It depends on what you're doing because a young program could be more nimble and more able to add different things to it, but you also don't have a track record, so that could work against you. Does somebody want to add to that? Allison, you look like I think it's, uh, I guess I would say that I think it's incumbent upon applicants to provide a compelling uh, vision for the program that they wish to create. And as, as Trish said, it may be in some ways easier um, to propose something innovative if you're not in an entrenched, uh, an entrenched academic uh, environment where you know the graduate programs have been defined for decades. Okay, I have a couple questions on eligibility here. Um, someone says, I heard the main PI should be a specialist in career training, but I also heard the PI should be an NIH funded researcher. These seem contradictory. Please clarify slash expand on PI qualifications. Well, I think we want some evidence that the PI has done work in career training, that they're not, you know, a chair of a department that has never even delved into this. Maybe they've run T32s. Maybe they are a graduate dean. Um, maybe they aren't. We've had a bunch of different models that came through and worked differently. So um, I think that multi-PI plans should just spell that out. So, so if I could just add, yeah. I don't see this as an eligibility issue. This is just like any other application that whoever is running this should be qualified to mm -hmm. run this and should be able to convince the reviewers that they're the right person to run this. Well put. It's not eligibility. Yep, yep. 
Here's one. We work with doctoral students on biomedical applications in various engineering departments, but we do not offer a PhD in biomedical engineering. Are we eligible? And I would say no, you have to be a degree granting university or program in order to apply. However, if you're working with these doctoral students, you would be, sounds like you would be a perfect partner and you should work with whoever, whatever institution is providing those doctoral students to you to apply. Okay. How many awards will be awarded? This is easy. Seven to ten. We don't know exactly yet. It depends on, you know, we need to get the applications in and see that we have seven to ten um, that are good enough, and then we'll see. They have to be really meritorious. Can you elaborate on potential evaluation metrics? What is considered a good evaluation approach? Are surveys slash interviews appropriate or are more quantitative measures desired? What? Would you? <laughs> the first answer given was yes and yes. Um, you know, I think the what I keep getting hung up on this evaluation business is there ought to be a goal for the program, it ought to be clear what the goal of the program is, and then the evaluation ought to be able to measure whether you achieve the goal of the program. And, you know, that's for people to figure out how they're going to evaluate it. And I should say that that was an important thing that came up in the review, that your evaluation plan was sound and that you had people that knew what they were doing in terms of evaluation. And again, just to stress that the evaluation should not be how many people participated in the program mm -hmm. and if they liked it. Mm -hmm. It's how, what are you trying to accomplish and then figure out some metric by which you can measure whether you accomplished it. Okay. Um, please provide examples of, quote, tangible evidence of faculty commitment. So this gets to faculty buy-in again, and what is tangible evidence? Tangible evidence, I suppose that in your application, the only tangible evidence you can give us are either letters or anecdotal um, evidence that X number of faculty are participating at different levels in different training activities and allowing their students to do X, Y, and Z, and or you have the faculty that are participating in some of the teaching, etc. So it's called faculty buy-in and it's definitely something we want to look at closely. Uh, an additional thing that, that might be attractive is to have faculty participating in their own developmental activities, uh, mentor, how to mentor, uh, how to lead other students into these career tracks. That's a good point. Okay, um, I have the same question a number of times for people that submitted previously, is this a resubmission application with an introduction and response to reviewers? And the answer is no, it is not. This is a new RFA number. It's a new application. You do not get to write an introduction. You do not respond specifically to reviewer critiques from last time. However, we certainly encourage you to keep that um, critique in mind and, and try to make your proposal stronger. How different should the submission be? Hopefully the submission will be better and you will respond to the reviews. You do not have to change the title. You do not have to change aims. Um, so we're not looking at criteria like that. That will not be um, flagged at CSR. Right, Larry? Uh, right. And then I want to add, Trish, that because these are going to be new applications, the reviewers, uh, if you're re if, if you're submitting another application and submitted one last year, the reviewers will not see your, your previous score or your previous summary statement. Okay. There's a couple questions. Oh, this is an easy one about budget. What F&A rate should be used? Instruction, research, or other? Research. This is a research grant and it's a full F&A rate. It is not the, it's not a training grant. It's not the 8% F&A. Um, Two things, again, about last year. What has been learned from the initial review 
and from funded programs in the first round. It's kind of open-ended. We could probably talk about that for hours. No? One thing that, that uh, struck me is that programs that were proposing small pilot uh, areas where only a few students would be affected did not seem to fare very well. Programs that had what appeared to be good or very promising interactions with a variety of partners seemed to do pretty well. Um, programs that took seriously the issues about faculty commitment and about the ways that either graduate students and or postdocs on their campus might interact and benefit from the program seemed to do quite well. I would agree with that. The other thing I wanted to mention was the advisory boards. They, the reviewers really appreciated when the advisory boards included people from their partners and it wasn't strictly um, just from the academic world. Larry. And I think as you're um, uh, establishing partnerships, it's important in the application to uh, clearly spell out what these partners are going to do and uh, if, if they're providing a letter of support, uh, uh, spell out in that letter what it is they're committing to do rather than some generic open-ended statement that says we, we support your program. Uh, reviewers are going to be looking for specifics about what's going to be done by that partner. I think that uh, including letters from all of the partners that you've been able to uh, uh, develop relationships with um, by the time of your application is, is a strong point. That was something that uh, last year a lot of reviewers had concerns when there was just a list of institutions but there was no evidence to really reinforce that this was uh, had really um, been established yet. Well, that's a good point. The other thing is that the reviewers really wanted to know what the students were going to do when they went off onto these experiences, whether it was an internship or just a short, whatever it was, um, not just stated that they were going to do an internship at X company. They wanted to know what the students would do, or postdocs, and they wanted details on that. So I have one more question. I think, oh, well, there's a couple more coming, but um, is there a website that provides ideas and best practices from programs funded in the first round? And I can tell you that all of the awardees are listed under the funded research page of this Common Fund program. So you can go to the web and find that. It shows you who is awarded. It shows you, it links to the NIH reporter page and gives you uh, their abstracts for their grants. And then we have another question is can we get a better sense of the awards that were funded more detailed than the abstracts. And um, we can't really give you those details at this point. I know that the, the group is working on writing a paper, but that's not going to help you in this time frame. Um, you are free to reach out to those individuals and they can talk to you or not, and they know that those calls may be coming, so they can yell at me. Go ahead. They know. Um, so, uh, no. of course, the awardee institutions can choose to share what they are doing, but I would hasten to remark that merely doing what yes. they have done will not be novel or transformative necessarily. So mimicking, mimicking what they are doing is probably not a good plan. Yes, very good point. If you're planning on having multiple partners, how many letters of support would be appropriate? One from each partner or just a sampling? No, I would echo what Nancy said. I think you need them from all your partners to explain what they would do in that partnership because, again, just a list of companies without any evidence that there's a meaningful relationship there was not compelling during the last round of review. We have several departments that grant PhDs in fields listed in the ACD report, molecular biology, neuroscience, et cetera. Are we eligible? Yes. If you're a degree granting institution and you grant degrees in those areas, yes, you are eligible. How is biomedical defined? So I think it's right in the very beginning of the FOA, and Nancy will quote it to us. NIH defines this in this RFA 
uh, where was that? Uh, biomedical includes behavioral, social, clinical, biomedical. What did I forget? I think that's right. It's yeah, that's spelled out pretty clearly in the RFA. And someone has asked whether we encourage people to collaborate with current awardees, and I think that speaks back to what Allison said: is that if you're you're collaborating with them, that that it's not really responsive to something that's new or novel. Um, you you might collaborate with them anytime, but I don't know that that would be part of um, a new award in our view. Will you please clarify on what you mean about the PI's experience or expertise in career training? Is the PI's experience as a mentor in the lab with PhD students or postdocs sufficient as evidence of experience in career training? I think the, the answer to this is you are proposing a program and is the PI well qualified to run this program? And you know, there's, there's no number of trainees that answers that question. Right. And there's no, and there's no requirement that the PI be, yes. have trained somebody in the lab. It's are you, whatever you're proposing is the person that's the PI, the right person to be doing this. That's right. There's not a certain number of criteria that we can give you. Um, I think this is my last question. This is something we changed in the RFA this year. Usually, and in last year's RFA, the NIH does not allow identification of advisory board members, especially if they're from outside the institution. Instead, you're usually asked to list expertise and et cetera. But this time, the RFA does ask for names of advisory board members. Is this correct? Yes, this is correct. You want to expand on that, Steve? Oh, I need to. I guess that says it all. <laughs> But I think it's also important to include a letter of support in the, from each of those advisory committee members, not just a list of the names of the people. Exactly. Yeah. What they are doing on the program and why, why they're involved. That is the last of the questions. I think I went through every single one. Um, again, you can continue to email questions to this email address that you see in front of you. Alternatively, you can um, reach out to me. My email is in the RFA, so you can email me directly, and um, I'll answer your questions and or make a time to chat with you. So I think that's it from us here today. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your Thursday. Goodbye. <laughs>